Jill, thanks for playing that. There's some beauty in, in the old hymns. I, I think several times that as I've sung those for, for many, many years, I, I've sung the, the soprano line, the, uh, the melody line, the alto line, uh, the tenor line, the bass line. And uh, as my voice changed, I simply moved down the scale. So I think I could sing every, every part of most of those hymns. And they bring back fond memories and great testimonies of faith. Let's begin with a call to worship. Every new morning is God's love. God's love poured out upon us, washing away the past, shining hope upon our path, awakening joy deep within, renewing the earth. Great is God's faithfulness. God's mercy never ends. One thing we celebrate every, every Sunday and every worship and perhaps every day is that uh, God is ever more ready to listen to us than we are to pray. So let's bring our whole selves to, to this particular time of prayer. Let's open our hearts uh, to God. Let's be honest in the acknowledgement of all of our shortcomings. Merciful Savior, we know that we are short-sighted and, and forgetful, and we are sorry. With the word you created all that is, and your word still has the power to deliver us from storms of doubt and fear. But we fail to call on you. We rely on our own resources rather than trust yours. We muddle through uh, along in weakness, uh, forgetting how readily available to us is, is your strength. Deliver us, gracious God. Calm the storm within us by, by being our peace and renew us in love and in trust. These things for the sake of Christ, we pray. We think of the power in the Old Testament and remember indeed that the power that stilled the sea is, <clears throat> is the same awesome power that defeated sin and death through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today we receive what he freely offers, forgiveness and new life. Hallelujah. Amen. Every Sunday we sing that marvelous uh, refrain, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We had a good time listening to these, and reviewing these scriptures uh, during our, our Wednesday evening Bible study. And it reminds me even more that we should pray that our minds and hearts might be illuminated. Therefore, Holy Spirit, before we even open the scriptures today, we need to stop and ask for your guidance. We tend to believe that we have all the answers, that we know all that there is to know. Humble us. Humble us so that we may learn from you. Studying the Word of God is no small matter, so not, let us not enter into it lightly. Let us prepare our hearts to be stirred and changed by the truth that we will encounter. Holy Spirit, be our guide. We will listen for your voice. Amen. We need to remind ourselves that we're moving toward the, the end of, of the Christian year, and we're moving through some very familiar passages of Scripture. We continue to, to follow up. Uh, Moses, in the book of Exodus, and we read from the 17th chapter. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from, from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. And so they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink! Moses replied, why do you, you why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses, and they said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die from thirst? And then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. 
And I will stand before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it. It will be there for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? And then we continue uh, reading today from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, a letter he wrote from prison, a letter which expresses his great love for the, uh, for the Philippians and speaks of their joy. And he writes this in the second chapter. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by, by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking for your own interests, but for each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then we read uh, what is indeed uh, perhaps one of the beloved hymns uh, of, the, of the Israelite people. Pardon me, the very hymns of, 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 of Paul. He writes this, Who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There, my friend, therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his own good purpose. And then we read, a, again, a familiar passage from, from Matthew. Remember that Jesus is now speaking in the temple courts. He's, he's entered the city in a triumphal procession on Palm Sunday. And now he finds himself in the temple courts. Jesus entered the temple courts. And while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question, and if you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I do these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human heart? Now they discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, Then why didn't you believe in him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they hold John to be a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, then neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first one, they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe in him. But the tax collectors and the Protestants did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent 
and believe in Him. There's a kind of neat story that is coming out of this whole age of artificial intelligence. It, it talks about a group of military leaders who succeeded in building the, the biggest, fastest, most able supercomputer uh, in, in the history of the world. It was able to solve any problem, didn't matter if it was larger or small, strategic or tactical, it could answer those problems easily. And so the military leaders assembled in front of this computer for, for a demonstration. And the engineer conducting the demonstration instructed the officers to, to feed a, a difficult tactical problem into it. And the military leaders proceeded to describe a, a very, very difficult hypothetical situation and then asked the computer the pivotal question, attack or retreat? And this enormous supercomputer with, with the lights buzzing and everything humming uh, that hummed away for an hour. And then it printed out a, a one-word answer. The word was yes. <laughs> the generals looked at each other and they were somewhat stupefied. They uh, Finally, one of them submits a second question to the computer. Yes, what? Instantly, the computer responded, yes, sir. That's what the military operates, isn't it? Yes, sir. If we take ourselves back 2,000 years, that's exactly how the Pharisees operated. They were like the generals. They were accustomed to people saying, yes, sir, to them. They were the religious authorities. They were the protectors of the Jewish traditions. And they really expected to be treated exactly like that. But now, now there's a, there's a new teacher in town. The teacher who was threatening their authority. A teacher who was gaining a, a, a lot of followers. And the Pharisees were alarmed, to say the least. They, they feared Jesus' popularity. They, they feared his ability to, to heal and perform miracles. You know, in, in, in their eyes, Jesus was, was preaching heresy. He was leading people away from their own cherished religious traditions and laws, the laws that, that defined Judaism. The Pharisees decided it was their job to, to expose him as a fraud. And it was in this context that Jesus told a story, a story that, that we all know well about a man who had two sons. To the first he said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And the boy immediately said, no. But Jesus said later he, he changed his mind and went. And then the father went to his other son and said the same thing. This one answered, okay. But he never got to the vineyard. Then Jesus asked a very simple question. Which one of these two did what the father wanted? And the answer was obvious, isn't it? The first one, they said. And then Jesus lets him have it with both barrels. He delivers the punchline. And I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the Protestants did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. And what a punchline. The Pharisees were, were gut-smacked, as a matter of fact. You know, I can imagine Jesus heard gasps from them. He probably heard gasps from the crowd. How dare he say that? It was unthinkable to compare these, these re religious Pharisees to the blatant sinners like the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Didn't he know the Pharisees were just too good to be lumped up with that kind of people? The likes of them? Didn't he know that the Pharisees were the folks with, with the right credentials? They were the ones who were going to make it into the kingdom of God. They had the passport. So what's this Jesus talking about when he's excoriating the, the best people in town? Well, that was a question hanging in the air, wasn't it? Uh, I came across an old, old Japanese legend that tells of a man who died and, and went to heaven. He said heaven was beautiful and full of lush gardens and glittering mansions and then the man came to a, to a, a strange room and it was, was lined with shelves and on the shelves were stacked human ears, nothing but human ears. And the heavenly guide explained that these ears belonged to, uh, to all the people on earth who went to church every week and listened to the word of God but never acted on God's teachings. He said their worship never resulted in action. They never changed their lives. So when these people died, their ears went to heaven 
And that's all. You know, right now, if you look at the analogy, Jesus right now is dealing with, 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 with a bunch of healless, earless religious folks. And consequently, if we take that illustration to mind, it, it would be to our benefit to listen to, to the conversation. You know, it's so easy to mistake the same self-righteousness in ourselves. To mistake our own self-righteous attitude as a as our belief in Jesus as our Savior. You know, we all can be guilty of it. This passage packs a powerful message to the Pharisees, to the Sadducees, to the people there, and certainly to us. And one of the messages is simply this, that God's grace is shocking. One fellow I read said, imagine splashing hot pink paint all over a black and white picture, tearing down the the." the tearing open the windows of a blackened room and letting the sun blaze through. Just imagine how these people must have felt. This whole new view of, of, of God that, that breaks down the, the barriers of everything that they've been led to think by the Pharisees, everything they've been led to think that was true. Jesus is talking about the kinds of folks who are going to be acceptable to stand before the, the holy, holy God. And he passes right over the religious professionals in in favor of the very worst sinners. Has Jesus lost his mind? Or really, could the truth be that uh, self-righteousness, our self-righteousness, doesn't buy us very, very many points with God? You know, maybe God isn't that cosmic scorekeeper, as we always say in St. Peter, with, with a book of, of the good things and the bad things. Maybe he's not tallying up the good things we've done and the bad things we've done. Maybe we don't have to earn God's love because... Maybe God loves us even when we fail. That, that sounds pretty simple. It sounds pretty simple to a whole bunch of very religious people in our world today. It sounds very simple, but, but those who, of us who cling to self-righteousness, they're, they're enough to, to shake the world to its foundation, to shake us to our very soul. This whole idea that God's arms are open to everyone, of every race, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, from every walk of life, from every circumstance. You know, Jesus is telling us we, we, we really miss something extraordinary when we try to, to put some boundaries on, on, on God's grace. I don't mean read much of James Dobson, but I came across an interesting story he posted a while ago. It was a story about his, his daughter, Deanne. She was a very attractive baby and toddler, he says. Uh, he said people always paid special attention to her, uh, they gave her candy, they oohed and odd over her. He thought mainly because she was so so darn cute. He said, but when she was about 15 months old, she she fell and, and, and she injured her face and she uh, injured her mouth. And uh, for a short period of time, her appearance had been strangely altered. And he said, remarkably, overnight, people began to treat her differently. He said, the strangers, when they saw her, no longer oohed and odd over her. They never... They, they stopped making a, this huge fuss over her. They stopped thinking about how, just how cute she was. He said the, the, the admiring, uh, sta admiring glasses became uh, you know, awkward stares. He said, while well, she was healing, our, our daughter hadn't changed in the slightest. She was still vivacious and smart and a loving toddler. But the folks who, who wanted to embrace her before were discouraged because of her outward appearance. You know, if we, we take that story and think about it, in the Pharisees' mind, God only uh, had regard for, for the things that were perfect, the things that were unblemished, the things that were without defect. They had reduced God to the level of human beings who, who turned away from the little girl whose face had been bruised when she fell on the ground. These Pharisees had no idea whatsoever of God's grace and God's love for all of his children even those of us who are remarkably tarnished with sin. Bonnie St. Jean, uh, John Don Dean, tells an interesting story in a book. She tells about the movie Hoop Dreams. Uh, it's a true story. For four years, a, a documentary film company uh, takes cameras and follows the lives of two very talented uh, high school basketball players. They come from the poorest neighborhoods in, in Chicago, and... One young man is significantly more naturally gifted than, than the other. He gets a, a, a high school scholarship, then he gets a posh summer job, then he gets a, a college scholarship. The problem is he, he gets the coach from hell. 
He's constantly badgering him and pressuring him and demeaning him. He's the style of coach that, that destroys any kind of love this kid had for the game. You know, the desire he had to play the game that he loved begins to crumble. He begins to sabotage his own success. He becomes more vulnerable to injuries. He, his grades drop. He becomes uh, socially dependent upon drugs and, and alcohol and sex. And somehow he gets ignored and his cries for help simply are, are, are unheard. Meanwhile, there's another kid. The kid with less talent, he gets less help, he gets less pressure. He's left to struggle in, in, in schools that point to, as, as highly regarded as, as the groups he'd been with before. There are some kids in those schools that uh, are, uh, have a negative impact upon him. He has to play, but it doesn't really matter how well he plays. His father was jailed for drugs, his mother had been on and off uh, off welfare, but he works to stay in school, to stay on the team. He, he wins a, a scholarship, and he goes on to play ball better than he'd ever played it before. And at the end of the story, it, it's apparent that he's, he's a happier, healthier person, much more likely to be successful with or without basketball. The Pharisees were like that demanding, badgering, pressuring, demeaning coach. They wanted perfection. Jesus knew that that wasn't the way to, to bring hurting people to the kingdom of God. He did it with love. He did it with, with acceptance. He did it by living out God's amazing, startling, almost absurd grace. So, isn't this the way we're supposed to live our lives? Aren't we supposed to be grace-filled? Aren't we to reach out to the little girls with a crooked smile and to old people with trembling hands? We're to value all people. We, we, we're called to make sure that all of them know that they're worthy of acceptance. We know that it's our mission to call them to and introduce them to the one who, one who died on their behalf, on our behalf. Again, I'm not a, a big fan of Mel Gibson, but he had a remarkable movie, The Passion of Christ, and I read about Maxine Raines, who's the director of ministry for, for the homeless in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. She knew that her, her homeless friends uh, couldn't afford a movie ticket. They couldn't afford to go see the movie, so she... She brought the movie theater to them. With the support of several churches and private donors, she, she created this huge outdoor theater under a downtown bridge where the homeless people always congregated. And she showed the film to a group of more than 400 street and homeless people. And she writes, many were moved to tears. Dozens came to receive Christ that night. I wanted them to, to, see, to be able to see that someone cared enough for them to give his life for them. They tell me they're helpless, they're hopeless, that no one can help them, and I say, the one I know can. Jesus tells us that nobody is hopeless, no one's beyond hope. Why? There was a man with nails in his hands who said, you're important and so important that I gave my life for you. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors, and the prostitutes are urging the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the Protestants, prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. Maxine Reigns took the kingdom of God to a, to a group of people who are usually overlooked, discounted, left out, laughed at, mocked. And many of them responded with repentance and faith because they knew now that no one is left out of God's grace. No one's excluded. Remarkably, not even the Pharisees. He said the tax collectors and the prostitutes would enter the kingdom before they did. The tax collectors and the prostitutes didn't carry any of the baggage of religi religiosity. All they knew was that they were forgiven and washed clean. Simply, Jesus simply widened the pathway into heaven. The Pharisees were part of it. But so were the people that the Pharisees could never count as equals. The Pharisees wanted a kingdom that was reserved to them and their kind, and Jesus wanted a kingdom that was big enough for everybody. I thought of James Meredith. 
name that might be familiar to you, way back in 1962. You know, you know the story of Barrett. He became the, the, the he made civil rights history as, as the first uh, black student ever to enter the Mi University of Mississippi. And that simple act uh, inspired race riots uh, in the surrounding town. Uh, he was laughed at, he was intimidated, he was beaten, but it didn't intimidate him. Four years later, in a bid to, to inspire black citizens in the South to vote, Meredith planned to walk from Memphis, Tennessee to Jackson, Mississippi. Named Jackson should be familiar to us. When that walk, he carried nothing but a walking stick and a Bible. It was a 220 mile effort to show that a black man could walk freely in the South. Meredith said, I was at war against fear. Well, I think we know what happened. When the second day of the walk, of James Meredith was ambushed by Aubrey James, Aubrey James Norville, a, a, a Memphis a hardware clerk. Norville shot him four times and left him to die in the middle of the road, and Meredith survived. And then a remarkable thing happened. As, as he was recuperating in the hospital, dozens and then hundreds and then thousands of people gathered to continue his walk from Memphis to Jackson. On the last day, a recovered Memphis, uh, Meredith accompanied 12,000 marchers entering the state capitol. I believe that that's what the kingdom of God is going to be like. One man was slain on a cross, and that started a, a remarkable parade. And at first, there were only a few brave folks to join it. And then that grew to hundreds, and then to thousands, and then to millions. And among these people, I think, are you know a, a few righteous souls. But the righteous are outnumbered by the, by the thousands and tens of thousands and millions of persons who haven't been all that they might have been, maybe all that they should have been, but they've been healed by the wounds of, of Jesus. The kingdom of God uh, uh, has come. That's the central message of Jesus' earthly ministry. The kingdom of God is marching forward and nothing can stop its forward momentum. Nothing can prevail against it, not even the gates of hell. And we have, we have a front row invitation to be part of it. That's the greatness of God's grace. Salvation can't be earned. It's a free gift of love offered for anyone who will accept it. So, we can't let our goodness get in the way of Jesus' righteousness. We can't let our sanctity overshadow Jesus' grace. Believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior and claim your place in the kingdom of God today. Amen. The church is one who delights in the coming to the aid of those who seek the Lord. We believe that God is always moving forward toward justice and righteousness and that we are invited to be agents of that movement. We believe that God is faithful and patient. God does not give up on us or on anything he has created. We believe that God is near, always present in our troubles and sadness and loneliness and fear. We place our hope in God because God alone is completely holy and trustworthy and true. Thanks be to God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We bow our heads in prayer. Merciful Savior, you are the faithful and good shepherd who laid down his life to protect your sheep, the ones that your Father entrusted to you. Such is the love that characterizes the kingdom of God and to which we are called as your followers. For you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are God's anointed one. By your life, death, and resurrection, you have inaugurated the reign of God upon the earth. Yet, still we are unsure Still we are mired in disbelief. Still we wait for something more. Perhaps we are simply waiting for this kingdom life to be easier. For loving our enemies and forgiving those who hurt us to be less painful and difficult. You have told us the truth. Kingdom love and life is the way of suffering. It is the way of self-sacrifice. It involves crosses and yielding our will to your will. Help us, O oh God. Help us to believe and help us to listen to the voice of the one who loves us with an everlasting love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And then may we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, our Father, 
Who art in heaven? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then we share a, blessed, share a prayer which talks about our generosity and our gifts. Gracious Spirit, you have showered us with your gifts. We embrace you with thanksgiving. We pray that our embrace may be arms wide open, ready to share, to serve, and to love. Use our spiritual gifts that we may live the spiritual life, moving according to the Spirit's heated touch and bending in the direction of God's holy will. Amen. May we pray, have a prayer of benediction and then our final hymn of worship. Let us go forth as workers together with God's proclaiming the good news, performing deeds of mercy and kindness, and giving evidence of Christ's love in all that we do. And may the grace of God be in us all. Amen.